Hello everyone. Why do monkeys invade Florida so aggressively? That's a question many people ask when they see the sudden increase in the number of monkeys in this area. What has fueled this explosion, and what are the consequences it brings to the state of Florida? Let's explore the causes and effects of this notable phenomenon of monkey invasion together. According to estimates, over 70% of tropical forest land in Florida has been destroyed in the past 100 years. Each acre of deforested land may cause the loss of habitat for two to five monkeys. With an average deforestation rate of 98.84 acres per year in Florida, approximately 80,000 to 200,000 monkeys lose their natural habitat annually. The strong invasion of monkeys in Florida is attributed to human destruction of their habitats. Each year, Florida residents clear a significant amount of trees and forests, leading to ecosystem imbalance. That leaves monkeys with no shelter and food, prompting them to invade residential areas. The primary reason for tree cutting is economic gain without considering the negative consequences for ecosystems and wildlife. This behavior adversely impacts biodiversity and natural equilibrium. Reports indicate that the most deforested areas in Florida are primary forests and coastal regions, the main habitat of monkeys, leading to a significant decline in their population due to habitat loss. The second reason leading to a significant increase in the invasion of monkeys is the habit of feeding them among Florida residents. This practice has drawn monkeys into urban areas. People often feed monkeys because they find them cute and want to create an enjoyable experience. However, this action also poses serious problems. Feeding monkeys makes them increasingly accustomed to living near humans and fosters dependency. With the growing number of monkeys, controlling them becomes more challenging, leading to security and safety issues for the community. Additionally, feeding monkeys large quantities of fruit results in widespread littering, affecting the environment. After feeding, the leftovers are often left uncleared. This issue is not confined to small towns but extends across various areas of Florida. Each time wild monkeys appear and are fed, their numbers increase, creating a negative cycle. Typically, monkey troops seek food in Florida during the mornings or evenings when human activity in residential areas is highest. This provides monkeys with easier access to food. The breeding population of monkeys in the state of Florida has unexpectedly surged, leading to a significant increase in their numbers over the years Breeding season mainly occurs in spring and summer, particularly from March to June, when weather conditions and habitat are most favorable. During each breeding cycle, a monkey can give birth to one to three offspring. Monkeys thrive and reproduce well during the rainy season when food is abundant. The population explosion has posed challenges for the Florida government in controlling them, especially in maintaining a balance between humans and wildlife.
From the reasons behind the explosion of invasive monkey species, are you curious to learn about the characteristics of monkeys in Florida? The invasive monkeys were initially brought in by veterinarians and individuals wanting to keep them as pets. Initially, there weren't many, just a few kept in households. However, the numbers have exploded from a few initially to millions today. They are highly agile and flexible, with excellent climbing abilities on tree branches. Their distinctive feature is the thick fur covering their bodies and faces, making them appear cute and attracting the attention of many. Their limbs are flexible and robust, enabling easy movement. They weigh on average from 10 to 30 pounds, depending on the species and age. They often live and operate in packs. They often use climbing techniques to steal coconuts from trees in people's gardens. By jumping from one tree to another, they quickly access the coconuts and cause damage to agriculture. In particular, farmers' cornfields are also frequently destroyed by monkeys. They steal corn from the fields, causing serious losses. Every year, the damage caused by monkeys invading cornfields can amount to thousands of dollars. Furthermore, the sudden increase in the number of monkeys has led to a shortage of natural food sources prompting them to seek food in residential areas. When they invade cities, they steal belongings from residents and tourists. This action not only affects the safety of the community, but also reduces the number of tourists, resulting in significant losses. The damage from this can amount to millions of dollars each year, posing a serious concern for the local economy. Residents and tourists should limit feeding monkeys. This behavior makes them dependent on humans and encourages them to venture into urban areas. After eating, monkeys often discard leftover food into the environment, causing pollution and providing conditions for disease causing bacteria. Close interaction between humans and monkeys also increases the risk of disease transmission from monkeys to humans. Therefore, to protect health and the environment, adhere to regulations and advice from authorities, refrain from feeding monkeys, and maintain safety during encounters. What do you think is the main cause of the serious consequences of the monkey population explosion? Comment 1 if you find the danger posed by these monkeys affecting people's safety. Comment 0 if you enjoyed this video. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe to the channel for the latest videos. The kangaroo is a pocket mouse. Their legs can jump at a speed of 50 kilometers per an hour, and they're especially an animal that keeps moving forward. This is what makes them a symbol of Australia. With the growing number of kangaroo populations, they have eaten some of the agricultural plants, affecting many of the water sources, making them considered an invasive species. Kangaroos spread all over Australia, there are three species that we usually see here, the red kangaroo, the eastern grey, and the western grey. They can live in tropical forests. Each of the kangaroos will have one male head. This male is about 8 feet tall and weighs about 250 pounds.
By the breeding season, the male kangaroos will attack each other to gain the right to mate with the females. Such matches usually end with a loss. There's danger around them, and the kangaroos will get into my pockets to be safer. After six years, the kangaroo population grew by 70%. The young are growing, and they've moved to other areas to feed themselves. They learn survival skills from their own mothers and other adults. With their fast speed, they can easily get away from predators like dingo hunters. Stop acting like it's hard for other wild animals to attack kangaroos. This is also one of the reasons why kangaroo populations are growing so fast. When the grass in the areas where they live is almost exhausted, they move to another area. These are the areas they've been through. The lawns are burning, the soil is cracked, and there's almost no water left for the bushes to grow. The vegetation has been severely affected. Droughts happen everywhere. The problem is worrying. Farmers' cattle farms are forced to move to other areas for food. Livestock farmers were very concerned about this. Grasslands take a long time to recover during such hot weather. They quickly appeared in all areas of the city. On the roads, we encountered them, causing traffic jams as a result. Not only that, but hundreds of kangaroos have been present on golf courses for several years now. The grass here almost does not grow. The staff here had to provide additional nutrients for the grass. They attack people who come to play golf, making them afraid, and some golf courses suffer a lot of damage because the number of visitors is gradually decreasing. Even on the road, they attacked several cyclists, causing them to fall. However, there is no denying that they have helped to revive the vegetation a great deal. Forest fires from grass have been significantly reduced. They have helped spread many rare grass seeds and provided nutrients to the plant carpet from their debris. Native Australians have always believed in and protected them. They take them to shelters and take care of them.
Despite this, the number of kangaroos continues to rise, but Australian hunters are licensed to hunt the species. When the night goes down, the Australians will start hunting. At night, the vision of the kangaroo is weaker, so the hunter has a chance to shoot them. They use long-sighted guns to hunt more easily. Every year about 5 million kangaroos are hunted. The harvested kangaroo will be prepared before returning to the processing plants. They'll cut off their tails, remove their organs, and cut off their heads. The hunters also have to explain the hunting area to the owners of the processing plant. Leather and kangaroo meat are all expensive products. Their meat can be sold in major stores and supermarkets. So far it has become one of the most expensive and rare meats available. Their leather parts are often used to make products for well-known brands. Nike is also a brand that uses kangaroo leather. Wild boars, powerful wild animals, are capable of causing a lot of damage to crops and people's property. Wild boar attacks on crop farms in the U.S are becoming increasingly serious, especially in recent years, when the number of wild boars in the United States is increasing rapidly. To cope with this situation, American farmers and hunters have applied many different measures. One of the most traditional and effective measure is hunting. The hunter's skill and knowledge of how to approach and handle wild boars has played an important role in controlling wild boar numbers and reducing damage caused to farms. However, faced with the rapid increase in wild boar numbers, more effective measures are needed. In addition to hunting, a new method has been applied in some areas in the United States, which is the use of aircraft to monitor and control wild boars. This is a challenging but potentially effective measure to reduce wild boar numbers and protect crop farms. A combination of traditional measures and a new method could help the United States deal with the growing problem of wild boar attacks on agricultural farms. The first step in wild boar hunting is to hire a suitable aircraft to carry out the task. Hunters often choose between helicopters and propeller planes, each with its own advantages. Helicopters are a popular choice due to their ability to fly lower and more flexible. They help hunters easily access hunting areas and observe wild boars from a vantage point. This aircraft is often used in areas with complex terrain and requires flexibility during hunting. Propeller aircraft, they're faster and also capable of moving quickly between hunting areas. This helps hunters to quickly deal with wild boars moving or spotted in different locations.
After renting a suitable plane, the hunter gets on the plane and flies to the hunting area. Before taking off, they thoroughly check safety equipment and hunting gear to make sure everything is working properly. When arriving at the hunting area, hunters use scopes to search for wild boars. Wild boars often gather in areas with lots of food and water, such as rice fields, cornfields, or forests with streams. However, it is often easier to find wild boars in crop fields than in fairly open and dense forested areas. In rice fields, hunters have wider vision and can easily observe wild boars from afar. This is where wild boars often appear to search for food such as corn seeds and other rice plants. When hunters notice a wild boar in the field, they can approach cautiously to shoot it. However, the most difficult situation for hunters is when they have to search for wild boars in dense forest areas or with more complex terrain. In these cases, wild boars may hide in the forest and use the terrain for cover and protection from hunting. Hunters will have to rely on their scope and observation skills to identify wild boar attacks and signs such as tracks, feeding areas, or footprints. When a wild boar is detected, the hunter informs the pilot and together they fly to the wild boar's location. Then, the hunter uses a hunting gun to shoot down the target animal. Typically, wild boars are shot from the back of the head or the neck to ensure the kill is quick and effective. The average range of a helicopter when hunting is about 750 feet. That means the helicopter can hit targets 750 feet away. There are hunting devices that can shoot at a range of 1,000 feet, so hunting can be done in many different ways with many skills. When the wild boar is downed, the plane lands and the hunter harvests the wild boar. This may include cutting, packaging, and transporting wild boars to processing areas or the market for sale. However, it should be noted that hunting wild boar by plane has its own advantages and disadvantages. Although this method allows hunters to access areas that are difficult to reach, by road and can hunt many wild boars in a short time. It also has high costs and can be dangerous for people and other animals in the area. According to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, in 2023, hunters in the U.S. will hunt about 1 million boars. However, this data may vary by time and specific region. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service estimates that currently the number of feral swines in the United States is about 1.2 million. Wild boars' attacks on crop farms are occurring in many areas of the United States, especially in the eastern and southern states. The rapid increase in the number of wild boar requires the use of objective measures to control the situation, and hunting by aircraft has become a useful method 
in the fight against attacks by the species. What do you think about this way of hunting? Please comment below in the comment section to let us know. And for now, we invite you to continue watching this video. Hunting and cooking wild boar meat in the wild of America isn't only a form of controlling the wild boar's population, but is also part of the culinary and enjoyable culture. Wild pigs, with their freedom of movement and omnivorous habits, are becoming an indispensable part of the American agriculture and food. Wild boars hunting in the field is usually done using rifles or bows and arrows. Hunters often have to follow footprints or wild boars to find their prey. After shooting down wild boars, hunters need to collect meat and animal carcasses for processing, followed by cooking wild boars meat Cooking wild boar's meat not only requires skills in food processing, but also brings unique dishes with rich and fresh flavors. Wild boar's meat has a unique flavor and good quality, and it is often processed into many delicious dishes such as stir fries, grill dishes, or stews. The combination of wild boars hunting and meat cooking creates a unique and exciting culinary experience while also helping to effectively control wild boars' populations. In addition, it also shows love and respect for nature, especially in a climate era concerned with environmental protection. However, to do this deliciously, it is necessary to prepare the meat thoroughly to eliminate the characteristic odor of wild boars. Cooperation between government and farmers is important to ensure that wild boar control measures are implemented effectively. However, it is necessary to follow safety rules and regulations when hunting, along with using appropriate weapons. In addition, wild boar meat also needs to be properly preserved to avoid spoilage. Despite the support of modern technology and equipment, hunting and cooking wild boar remains connected to nature and is an important part of the culinary and cultural lifestyle in America. But when it comes to hunting wild snow geese, cooking the wild snow goose meat isn't only a fun activity, but also an important part of culinary culture in America. With wild snow geese typically appearing in the fall, this hunting season marks the promise of new experiences and a chance to enjoy the unique flavor of wild snow goose meat. The hunting season for wild snow geese in the U.S. usually starts from October to December, when wild snow geese move across the U.S. in search of food and breeding grounds. They often appear in wheat, corn, and vegetable fields where they can search for a lot of food. Using rifles in hunting is subjected to the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. Regulations to ensure the activity is conducted in a sustainable manner and to ensure the preservation of wildlife. Some tips for successful wild snow goose hunting include choosing the right location, being all equipped with tools and equipment, choosing the right rifle, and practicing shooting regularly. Wild snow goose meat 
has a sweet taste and is dark red in color. While snow goose meat can be prepared into many different dishes, including grilled wild snow goose meat. Wild snow goose meat provides protein and healthy fats and contains many valuable vitamins and minerals such as vitamin A, vitamin B, iron and zinc. When cooking wild snow goose meat, the cooking process needs to be done carefully by washing the meat, removing excess skin and fat, marinating the meat in spices and cooking at low temperature to cook the meat evenly. Hunting and cooking wild snow goose meat isn't only a fun activity, but also an important part of American culinary culture, providing delicious and nutritious food for lovers of this unique meat. One of the measures to deal with invasive wild parrots is hunting. So hunting for Cetacula cremary parrots requires fairness and tactics. Hunters have to often get close to parrots without them detecting them. This requires a perfect camouflage and a wise choice of hunting location. One of the target is set. Stillness and accuracy in firing are crucial. Parrot hunting requires high skill and fine-tuning hunters must know how to judge distance. The psychology of parrot flocks and even the wither. Parrot hunting isn't only about patience and skills on the part of the hunter, but also requires respect and understanding for the surrounding environment and animals. According to documented records, every year thousands of Pistacula cremary parrots are hunted in Australia to control their population growth. This data demonstrates the importance of hunting in protecting Australia's environment and food resources. At the same time, it also demonstrates the efforts of professional and passionate hunters in maintaining the balance of the Australian ecosystem. Hunting isn't only the method of capturing invasive wild parrots. We should use other methods to handle them in the most humane way and without affecting the habitat of surrounding species. The bow and arrow, which is one of the main tools for hunting Cetacula cremary parrots, has undergone many improvements to become more effective On the farms and fields of Australia, professional hunters often use long, powerful bows and arrows, carefully crafted for optimal accuracy and power. In particular, modern bows and arrows are equipped with automatic range aligning engines, helping to increase the ability to hit the target These inventions made hunting more efficient and reduced the risk of missed shots, ensuring that changes in the natural environment were minimal. Once they have placed their bow and arrow within range, they must check the wind situation and measure the distance accurately to ensure accuracy in shooting. Hunters often use laser range finders and wind sensors to determine surrounding conditions. This requires them to have a deep knowledge of the weather and environment and the ability to improve quickly to optimize target shooting opportunities. The objective of parrot hunting in Australia 
is to maintain a balance between protecting local species and controlling the overpopulation of Cetacula cremary parrots, which if left unchecked, it can be harmful to the environment. And this requires strong cooperation between hunter groups, nature conservation organizations, and government agencies. Hunting data statistics are carefully collected and monitored to ensure that the activity is carried out within the regulations and limits established to protect the environment and local animals. Hunting for Cetacula cremary parrots isn't always easy. Emigrant farmers tried optimal measures. They even literally tried catching parrots with a glue, a very simple way. They used a thick, fragment patch of glue to attract Cetacula cremary parrots, which then became trapped when they got close to the glue. This requires sophistication and skills in choosing the ideal location to set the trap and patience in waiting. Once the glue trap has been used effectively, hunters need to demonstrate skills in approaching trapped Cetacula cremary parrots. Each year, hundreds of thousands of parrots are captured using glue traps, helping to control their numbers in the wild. There are many different species of parrots that are also invasive and have negative impacts on the agriculture and the environment of Australia. The areas hardest hit by their prisons are concentrated in the eastern states and territories including New South Wales, Queensland, Victoria and Tasmania. The spread of these parrots causes damage amounting to hundreds of millions of Australian dollars annually, a figure that cannot be ignored. Another story from the state of New South Wales continues to be a classic example of parrot devastation. A hopeful farmer faced disaster when more than 100 hectares of his rice crop was completely destroyed by mischievous parrots. Not only that, a soybean field in Queensland state became a bare patch of land because they ate all of the beans, causing farmers to suffer serious losses that year. It is heartbreaking stories like these that have made the fight against parrot invasions a national priority. In addition to economic losses, the presence of invasive parrots threatens Australia's biodiversity. As one environmentalist has noted, they create unwanted transformation in Australia's ecosystem Local plants and animals are facing disappropriate competition from these invaders, weakening the fabric of Australia's natural ecosystems and causing environmental imbalance. With the fight, Australia is making efforts to protect what is precious and unique in their nature. The government along with support from farmers scientists and environmental enthusiasts is working hard to ensure that parrots no longer become a threat to the economy and unique nature of Australia. So my dear beloved audience, from your humble opinion, 
If you have any other methods of how to deal with wild parrots in Australia, Make sure to leave that in the comment section to let everyone know. And for now, we will go with you to another land to experience another interesting thing. Let's continue watching. The question here is, why do wild boars move to urban areas? Someone said that about 10 years ago, there was a man walking through the forest. He encountered a wild boar in the way and fit it. This action of his opened the door for wild boars to approach the city. Wild boar feeding in the city is happening a lot. Therefore, the first thing is not to feed wild boars. Feeding wild boars in the city is strictly prohibited so that bad things don't happen. In addition, houses and areas where people live should build fences to prevent wild boars from entering people's houses. This man told us about wild boars appearing around his house. They travel in search of food, causing destruction to the surrounding environment. He immediately bought materials to build a fence around the house. This fence can not only prevent wild boars from entering, it can also prevent many other species from attacking his house. Simply using wood to make them, the price is quite cheap compared to some other types of fences. Besides limiting wild boars' intrusions, this wooden fence also carries a series of other benefits. First of all, using wood as the main material helps minimizing the impact on the environment, such as using materials as metal or plastic. It also promotes the regeneration of wood trees, helping to protect forests and meet environmental protection goals. Not only that, the flexibility of wooden fences also allows for easy replacement and maintenance when needed. This means saving time and money in maintaining infrastructure. Keeping dogs in the family isn't only a safety measure for your home and security, but also a form of creating a special bond between humans and your pets. Dogs are always loyal companions, always ready to protect and care for their families. Taking your dog for a walk in the evening not only creates a good opportunity to relax and enjoy natural spaces, but is also especially useful and protecting against wild boar attacks. They have the ability to be alert and detect the presence of wild boars before you, allowing you to take timely preventative measures. Furthermore, they also demonstrate patience and concern for you when wild boars approach your home area. They will bravely face this threat and will not hesitate to chase them away, protecting your space from encroachment by wild creatures.
In some areas of the city, many people raise wild boars as pets. They feed them milk and family foods. Moreover, they also let them rest and live in their house. And sometimes, this could be a little dangerous for the family. There are species that live in herds. If they are unlucky, they will smell the characteristic scent of pigs in your house and come towards you. Although it may feel very familiar to raise wild boars and treat them like family members, remember that they are wild and their nature is still in them. In a moment, they can turn into a dangerous threat, especially when they feel hungry or excited by the smell of food. Keeping wild boars indoors isn't only dangerous, but can also disrupt the harmony of their environment and affect their naturalness. Therefore, wild boars should not be raised under any circumstances. If wild boars appear around your area, immediately report them to the police. The police will come and deal with this dangerous threat. Someone told us one day that a very large wild boar appeared in the park and they took over the sand as their resting area. The surrounding people were very scared and called the police. They came and solved the problem. They chased them away from residential areas, ensuring people's safety. This clearly shows the importance of maintaining cooperation with authorities. The police are always ready to respond to dangerous situations, protecting the community from unforeseen threats. However, warning and creating information about the appearance of wild boars also plays an important role. When we work together, we have the ability to create safer environments for everyone. The encroachment of wild boars into cities is largely due to humans. You need to be very careful when handling household waste. Do not throw trash in such public places, as they will attract wild boars, and wild boars will pollute the area immediately. Do not go alone in areas where wild boars often appear. It is very dangerous for you. If there are any measures that I haven't mentioned, please comment them down below in the comment section to let us know. And for now, let's continue watching the rest of the video. Locusts are a unique insect species are now becoming a serious threat to crops and socio-economy across continents, including Africa, Asia, and America, even Africa. They gather in millions at breakneck speed and destroy everything in their path. This phenomenon has attracted the attention of the scientific community and environmental managers around the world. The locust epidemic not only causes serious economic damage, 
but also threatens the well-being of millions of people. They have the potential to destroy crops and increase food shortages and famine, causing instability among farming communities and those who depend on food from agriculture In addition, locusts also have the potential to cause health problems, including diseases and allergies, affecting people's quality of life. To deal with this threat, the use of pesticides has been considered the most effective measure to destroy locusts. However, it should be noted that this method can cause negative impacts on the environment, so it's important to look for other solutions, including research on preventive control and use of management methods. Sustainable management is essential to ensure the safety of the natural environment and humans in the future. Sparrows, a bird that favors a variety of seeds and grains, including rice, corn, and beans, are becoming a serious threat to crop yields around the world. The sparrow's ability to cause damage cannot be underestimated and it threatens the global food and agricultural establishment. Knit traps have become an effective measure to reduce damage caused by sparrows. The operating principle of knit traps is based on luring birds into the net and they are made from highly durable nets that can withstand the height of sparrows. Knit traps are placed in areas where sparrows commonly occur, such as near rice, corn and bean fields. However, the harmful effects of sparrows are still great on the fields. According to a report by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United States, referred to as the FAO, sparrows are one of the most common pests of crops in the world. In the United States and Europe, sparrows cause millions of euros in agricultural damage each year. But in Asia, sparrows cause billions of dollars in agricultural damage each year. So to minimize this damage, the use of knit traps along with other protective measures is extremely important. Sparrows can significantly impact the food and economic resources of countries, and research the implementation of effective protection measures will play an important role in protecting food resources and agriculture. Pheasants, a pest present in all fields, are becoming a serious challenge for farmers. Although it is less harmful than some other species, pheasant population are growing rapidly, causing nuisance and damage to farmers. One of the traditional means of controlling pheasants is hunting. However, 
this method is becoming increasingly ineffective and dangerous. Farmers have realized the value in catching pheasants and raising them as a valuable asset. This has led to a decline in pheasant hunting and opened up a new approach to managing this population. Raising pheasants on their own farms has proven to be one of the best ways to control pheasant populations. It helps farmers control the quality and quantity of pheasants in their controlled environment, minimizing impact on fields and natural food sources. In particular, pheasants raised on farms can become an additional source of income for farmers and help maintain the ecological balance in the area. By catching pheasants and raising them, Farmers not only minimize the impact of these birds on their fields, but also create a sustainable solution to the problem. This demonstrates the change in farmers' attitudes and actions while helping to protect fields and the agricultural environment. Not only pheasants, deers are also one of the invasive species across fields in some countries around the world. They are said to regularly destroy fields by eating people's crops, causing billions of dollars in damage annually. This is posing a serious challenge to the agriculture and the economic apparatus of many countries. The government has taken extreme measures such as hunting them to control the situation. Residents and hunters traveled to these areas to hunt deers, and their populations were suppressed in just a few years. However, it is necessary to carefully consider whether hunting is the best solution In this situation, another option we need to consider is moving them to national parks or large natural forests. Instead of eliminating them in an extreme way, we can consider taking advantage of nature to create a more balanced environment for deers. This also helps protecting biodiversity and maintains the environmental balance. This problem requires careful discussion and research to find the optimal solution. We should consider all options and listen to the community to ensure that we are implementing effective and sustainable measures in managing deers and managing our resources. And for now, you can leave all your comments down there in the comment section. And lastly, don't forget to share, like and subscribe to the channel so you're always staying tuned with any of our upcoming videos. So since these solutions have been affecting and preventing the growth of colonies of some invasive species, do you believe in any other better solution?
If so, please don't forget to share your comments and opinions down below. Plus, don't forget to share, like, and subscribe to support our channel with our upcoming videos. And lastly, don't forget to share this video with all your friends so that they can watch it and enjoy it as well.